Okay, welcome back, everyone. Um, hope you all had a good weekend. Uh, I'm going to continue uh, today talking about minimum spanning trees. And in fact, I think minimum spanning trees will pretty much take us through to the end of the week and the end of the course. Um, so, uh, so today we'll finish uh, discussing two-dimensional uh, and more generally Euclidean minimum spanning trees. Uh, and start discussing the mean field setting. Um, then my plan for the rest of the week is to uh, first talk about uh, the global structure of the minimum spanning tree of uh, complete graphs, so in the mean field setting, um, similar to uh, what we did for uniform spanning trees at the start of the course. So we'll try to get a handle on global distances. Uh, we won't get quite as detailed for the uh, minimum spanning tree. I won't talk about precise uh, details of finite dimensional distributions, just about the uh, <coughs> the diameter, the typical distances between uh, points and the extreme distances between points. Um, then we'll uh, focus on the uh, local structure. Oh, there's a fair amount of noise coming from somewhere. I think I'm going to mute someone. Um, uh, then we'll, then we'll focus on the uh, local structure of minimum spanning trees um, and use the local weak convergence methodology that was uh, alluded to and used in Kavita Ramanan's lectures uh, to describe in a bit more detail the local structure of the mean field MST. And finally, use the, uh, the local perspective to uh, understand the typical weight of the minimum weight spanning tree, which after all is quite a natural uh, uh, parameter to study, uh, given that the tree is defined by uh, minimizing the weight. Okay, so that's, um, so that's where we're headed. Um, uh, as I said, today we're going to um, be um, starting off by finishing our discussion on the Euclidean setting. Uh, you all should be able to unmute yourselves to ask questions, and I'll keep an eye on the chat as well. Um, so let me remind you where we left off on Friday. So, um, uh, so we saw uh, two connections between uh, uh, so minimum spanning forests and uh, critical percolation. Right. So, um, so the first of those said that if uh, if the probability that the origin is in the um, the um, the cluster invaded by uh, invasion percolation or a Prim's algorithm, um, starting from a far off vertex v. So if that probability tends to zero as the distance uh, of that vertex from the origin tends to infinity, then on the corresponding lattice, uh, the, uh, the probability of percolation at the critical parameter PC is equal to zero. Okay, um, so perhaps I should say 
uh, the whole thing's happening inside D there. Uh, so that we proved rigorously, and I think someone remarked that in fact the proof uh, goes through on any uh, so fully symmetric a transitive graph. So a graph where any there's an automorphism uh, sending any vertex to any other vertex that has the property of uh, unique infinite clusters, which we discussed in that lecture. So the proof is somewhat more general than how I presented it. Um, and then we also saw this, um, this picture of, um, of invasion percolation, which was a little bit more heuristic. Uh, as sort of um, zooming in on the critical uh, percolation parameter by exploring this sort of sequence of pawns, a sort of first, uh, a first collection of, of vertices, which it builds a spanning tree for, and then some edge, which is sort of the largest weight edge that it will ever explore, followed by another uh, second pond, the second uh, sort of spanning tree of some region, and then the largest weight edge that it will ever explore after that. Um, and sort of continuing in this way that you, the, 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 um, the, this sequence of, of sort of future maximal edge weights get closer and closer to the critical probability. And we in particular stated that, um, you know, if, uh, so EN are the edges explored by invasion percolation on said D from an arbitrary starting point, the symmetry means we don't, it doesn't matter where we specify, uh, where we start from for the statement to hold, then the limb soup as n tends to infinity of the edge weight of En converges almost surely to the critical probability PC of ZD. Okay. Um, and I'd like to, um, maybe uh, use this, uh, oh no, I think, I'll, I think I'll leave the discussion there. Uh, and now just, uh, unless there are questions, focus in on the case of uh, two dimensions, which is uh, uh, a setting where a little more can be said using the special structure of planar percolation. Okay, so, uh, so now, uh, now we'll focus on two dimensions. Um, and in this setting, there's the uh, famous harris keston theorem, which uh, identifies the percolation critical probability as a half, and also says that there's no percolation at criticality. So if you look at the probability um, at a half of an infinite uh, cluster existing, that probability is zero, right? So equivalently, this is saying that, uh, this statement is saying that if on, you know, this lattice I've got drawn right here, you just flip a fair coin to determine whether each edge is going to be present or absent, right? And color the present edges uh, blue and the absent edges pink, then the probability that there's an infinite uh, cluster connected cluster of blue edges is zero, okay? Uh, but because the coin is fair in this case, because the, the, the critical probability is exactly a half, that also means that the probability of an infinite cluster of pink edges is zero. It doesn't matter in this special case whether I talk about the um, sort of edges we add or the edges that we don't add because the, the two marginals have the same, uh, or, or the two subgraphs have the same distribution. Okay, that wouldn't be true in um, dimensions three or higher where the critical probability is less than a half. There, um, you know, the, if you look at the absent edges, um, that, that'll be more denser than the present edges at the critical probability. And so um, the sort of, if you reverse the role of red and blue, you don't, um, you don't see the same picture. Okay, um, so, uh, so a, a sort of important consequence of this for the story about um, minimum spanning forests and trees is that um, it, it means that, uh, a, you know, a fixed point of the lattice can be sort of separated from 
uh, from infinity by large um, closed or, or open circuits. So I'm using the term closed and open to refer to um, that's sort of equivalent language to saying uh, edges that are absent or present. Open edges are present and closed edges are absent. Okay, so um, so let me let me uh, make a definition. So if we're given a subgraph uh, G of Z2, then an open circuit uh, around, uh, uh, well, let me say, um, let, let, me, let me start again. I want that, that I'm making things a little more complicated than I need to. So we'll say that um, uh, a closed circuit around zero uh, in Z2, uh, So this this will be a um, a circuit uh, all of whose edges have weight greater than p. Right. So re remember that we um, we defined uh, this this graph here as having edges. Uh, so the set was the edges E for which the weight was at most P, right? So, uh, so these are the open edges. And then we're just saying a closed circuit is, is, a, is a circuit all of whose edges are closed. So that's a picture uh, like this, right? And maybe um, I think I just said that I was going to use um, pink for closed edges. So it's a picture like this, OK? And the fact that at uh, P equals a half, the probability of percolation is zero means that we can find arbitrarily large closed circuits uh, encircling the origin. So for any integer n, uh, so um, almost surely, so the critical percolated lattice um, has a closed circuit around zero, which does not intersect uh, the, um, the, the centered box of side length 2n around zero either. So not intersecting uh, minus n and squared. OK, so this is, um, this, is, this is just saying, you know, no matter, no matter how far away from the origin you go, then then you can still find with probability one some some barrier some closed circuit which which witnesses the fact that the origin is not an infinite component and the reason that um, this is implied by no percolation is just that uh, you know if there was uh, if there was some chance that there was no such closed circuit around a large box well that would mean that there was there had to be a, uh, an infinite path starting from the boundary of that large box Okay, but then if there's an infinite, if there were an infinite path starting from the boundary of some large box, then with positive probability, you you um, you could get really lucky and just have you know all of the edges in this box come up heads. So they're all they're all open, and that would create a path from the origin to infinity. Okay, so if there were if there were any chance uh, of of this event, um, any positive chance of this event failing, that would also imply a positive chance that the origin was connected to an to an infinite component. Okay, um, but you know now using the special property that PC is a half, this also means um, that there are open circuits around zero of arbitrarily large size. So equivalently, that's since uh, PC is a half, uh, almost surely. So Z two a half has an open circuit. around zero, which doesn't touch a large box. Okay, so that's, um, 
that's sort of the only facts from percolation. I'm not going to prove that, um, but it's a, it's one of the sort of fundamental facts about planar probability. Um, you can find it in uh, many presented nicely in many uh, uh, textbooks, including um, so the the percolation textbooks by Grimmett or by uh, Bolabash Riordan. Uh, if you're looking for a reference, those are two reasonable ones. Um, probably it's also, it also appears in uh, Hugo Dominique Copin's um, notes from this very sequence of summer schools a couple of years ago. I can't swear to that, but I suspect it's in there. Um, okay, um, but now I'd like to you know use this fact to uh, to, pr to say something about um, minimum spanning forests. So this this goes back to uh, Jay's. Chase and Newman again. I think I stated this on Friday. So, uh, so in Z2, almost surely the minimum spanning forest is a tree. Okay, um, and I've I've dropped the um, I've dropped the use of um, wired or free because we said they were equivalent in this uh, in this setting. But uh, I'm just going to make a quick comment about those um, terms, which I didn't make last lecture. Um, uh, after the lecture, someone um, kindly pointed out to me it would have been good to sort of explain where the where the um, the terms wired and free come from. So if you one way you can um, rather than sort of defining these these objects directly in the infinite volume limit, uh, that you could sort of try to um, try to understand what the minimum spanning tree of Z2 should look like is precisely by, you know, taking a, uh, a large box, okay, uh, you know, with so minus n, n squared, like we've been using here, taking the minimum spanning tree of that, asking what the local structure is near the uh, near the origin and hoping that those local statistics converge as n tends to infinity. So you just, you know, look at a, look at a small window of size, k, a small box of, you know, fixed finite side length 2k, and then let n tend to infinity and hope that the sort of local picture in here converges for any k as n tends to infinity. Okay, but then there's sort of two things, two, th there's some question about what you do at the edge of this large box. Do you, um, you know, do you uh, leave all of the, do you just view these as kind of um, independent points so that each one has to be attached to uh, separately? Or do you wire them all up? Do you, you know, join them by a circuit to start so that then you have sort of trees coming in from an outer circuit, you know? And, and, and then the question is, does well, a, a natural question is, does the picture you get depend on your choice of boundary conditions? So, um, so wired boundary conditions where you make an outer circuit, um, you can show yield the wired spanning forest we discussed and free boundary conditions where you leave the boundary uh, vertices completely disconnected yield the free spanning forest. Okay, and in the, and in, you know, the theorem um, uh, that they're the same in, uh, and of course that makes sense, not just on ZD, but on more general graphs. You can take an exhaustion of, uh, of your, graph and look at the local structure and hope that converges. Okay, um, so uh, so it turns out that, you know, at least in uh, the Euclidean setting, it doesn't matter whether you take wired or free boundary conditions, you'll get the same local picture near the origin. <coughs> okay, um, so, uh, so what I'd like to do uh, now is use this fact from percolation to prove the Chase and Newman, uh, Chase squared and Newman result. Um, so, uh, so let's go straight to that. Um, so I want to, um, uh, I want to show this by, so my goal will be to fix arbitrary po um, lattice points UV, okay, and just show that, uh, the invasion percolation, I've started calling them invasion percolation trees, the trees built by Prim's algorithm. So the invasion percolation trees 
TU and TV almost surely intersect. Okay, if, if that's true for any pair of trees, um, then that means that all of these trees uh, join up in, into one big tree together, right? Uh, so this, uh, that, so if we prove that, we prove the theorem. And in fact, we'll prove, um, we'll prove slightly more than this. We'll actually show that these, that for any two uh, vertices of the lattice, the invasion percolation trees will almost surely only differ on a finite number of uh, edges. So their, their symmetric difference will be finite, okay? Um, uh, so to prove this, we we're going to uh, find one of these open loops that we uh, said was guaranteed to exist, which surrounds uh, U and V to start. Okay, so, um, so let's, um, uh, let's let, um, let's let uh, N be large enough. that uh, u and v are in minus n n and then let uh, gamma be a, an open circuit of uh, the critical percolated lattice which doesn't intersect that box Okay, um, and uh, one more, I'll draw a picture in just a second, but let me give myself one more definition. Uh, let's, uh, let's let um, C gamma. So these, so these edges are all open, right? Um, and so now I'm, th there might be other, so this is some, uh, some circuit of open edges, but there might be other open edges connected to that circuit, sort of going here and there and everywhere. Okay, and those form a connected component of, uh, of this um, percolated lattice. So that'll, I'll call that C gamma. So that's the connected component of uh, Z to a half containing gamma. And so now let me grab my picture of that. Okay, so here's um, here are U and V. In in the in yellow we have the box uh, minus n n squared, right? And then in red we have the circuit gamma, and then uh, so the red plus the black is C gamma. So everything um, you know the circuit plus everything attached to it by open edges. Okay, so yeah, um, you know, maybe black should have been blue for my previous con conventions, but uh, I hope the picture is clear. Uh, this is a connected component with all edge weights less than a half. So I've taken, um, I've taken an open circuit here rather than a closed circuit. There was a question in the chat whether these are um, edge weights greater than or less than a half. Yeah, so let me say, so um, that's important. Um, so all, all red and black edge weights are less than a half. Okay. And now let me give myself one more definition and a new color to go with it. Um, so, uh, so let's let um, E gamma be the set of lattice edges. Uh, in the unbounded connected component of uh, R2 when this component C gamma is removed. Okay, so maybe I'll make my picture a little bit more, um, uh, just a very slightly more uh, uh, involved by adding one edge. Okay. Um, so then the edges I'm talking about are sort of all of, all of these edges out here. OK, 
every every edge that when you remove everything everything inside this uh, this region spanned by C uh, by C gamma, what heads to the rest of the world? Um, uh, uh, Z2 minus. Uh, hmm. So I think what, what I'm saying is, if you remove all the, if you remove all of these, if you view these edges as embedded, right, then you remove all of the vertices and edges of, uh, of, uh, of the component. Then you're left with an, you're left with an unbounded, uh, uh, you're left with a bunch of connected components of R2 of the plane, and and uh, and one of them is unbounded. Yeah. And and that component is unique because C two because C gamma is almost surely finite. So this is C gamma is finite almost surely since there's uh, well all all components of Z two uh, at the critical percolation probability are finite almost surely. So there's this unique unbounded component. Okay, is that picture clear enough? So now let's think about what uh, uh, what Prim's algorithm or invasion percolation started from U and V are going to do. Okay, so at the start they don't. At the start they each do their own thing. You know, U explores over here, V explores over here. Um, one of them might hit uh, C gamma before exiting this box. One of them might exit the box first and then hit C gamma. Okay. But all of the edges uh, in, you know, at, at, the moment the, at the moment that, say, the exploration from V enters C gamma, right, it did so by following an edge of weight at least a half, because C gamma is a component of the graph where the edges have weight at most a half. The whole boundary of C gamma has weight bigger than a half, right? So um, all edges... leaving C gamma have weight greater than a half. So that means, you know, the exploration from, from V, it goes along somewhere using maybe some edges of weight bigger than a half, some less than a half. At some point it adds an edge into C gamma. And at that point, all the edges leaving this bounded region that it's explored have weight bigger than a half, okay? Uh, and now it, um, it, it can, you know, do some nice long exploration inside of this component using only edges of weight less than a half, right? And similarly, starting from U, you know, the exploration goes along. At some point it adds an edge into C gamma that's forced because it's trapped in a bounded component. So it certainly eventually has to touch C gamma. Okay, and then it can do some nice long exploration within C gamma, okay? Uh, shouldn't, there's a question in the chat, shouldn't be bigger than, or equal than a half. The edges that connect to C gamma are not in C gamma, so they must have weight at least a half because C gamma has only edges of weight. Uh, C gamma is a component of the graph with, with edges of weight less than a half. Okay. Um, there's another question in the chat. Is this closed circuit part of the original graph or in the dual? This is, so all of the red and black edges have weights less than a half. So that means it's th th they're open edges, if you like. Okay, but I mean, if uh, the point is that the invasion percolation likes small weight edges, right? So it's um, it, it's gonna once it once it gets into this component, it's gonna be happy for a while. It's gonna explore within the component until it is forced to leave. Another question in the chat. If it would be in the original graph, then there could be an outgoing edge of gamma that has smaller weight. I'm not sure I understand the question, I'm sorry. Um, so, uh, Right. So we took a we took a circuit. All of his edges had weight less than a half. We took its connected component, and then uh, uh, then this is the sort of well, not just the outer edge boundary, but in particular includes the outer edge boundary. Okay. So now the point is that um, you know 
when when any when either of these two explorations decides to that it's done as much as it can within C gamma and has to leave for the unbounded region. Okay, it's going to take the smallest weight edge in the unbounded region. Okay, it's going to take the smallest. It's going to follow the smallest green edge. Because I mean, it just it it it, it, it it's it, it always follows the smallest available edge. And so, in particular, when it has to choose an edge of E gamma, it'll choose the smallest um, the smallest edge of the of the unbounded outer boundary. And so that's true for um, whether the exploration starts from U or from V. Okay, so, um, so Prim's algorithm. Started from either. U or V. Explores the same subset. Of, uh, of E gamma and in the same order. Right? Because, uh, because for as long as for as long as the um, exploration chooses not to uh, explore in the un, uh, well, for as long as the exploration has edges of weight less than a half available to it, it will explore them. And uh, and when it ceases to have such edges available to it, well, um, you know, the first thing it might do is do some more exploration on the inside of the component. The smallest available edge of weight greater than a half doesn't have to lie in the unbounded region. Okay, but what? But when? But when the algorithm is whether wherever it starts, when the algorithm is forced to explore into the unbounded region, it'll it'll take the smallest weight edge leaving for the unbounded region. Okay, because it will already have had to fully, you know, to, to touch every vertex of CV, because all those vertices can be reached by edges of weight less than gamma. Okay. And then, so, you know, the first, whether you start from U or V, the first edge of E gamma you explore, you know, will, will be the same. Maybe it's, uh, maybe it's this edge here. Okay. And then after that, the second edge of E gamma you explore will also have to be the same, because the first one was the same. And so now you again have the same sort of outer edge boundary. Maybe the second edge you explore is you know, over here, or maybe it's one that attaches to the first edge. But whatever it is, at each step that, at each step of the algorithm, which which does explore into the unbounded region, the set of available edges um, is paired up so that those are always the same outer boundaries. And so uh, the, the exploration has to always choose the same next edge because it's always that one edge that is the smallest weight edge that, that remains. Okay, so that means, in, that means uh, so in particular, uh, that if we look at the subtree of TU that intersects E gamma, that's the same, not the, not the size, but the actual sub, the, the collection of edges of TU in E gamma, that's the same as the collection edges of TV in E gamma. Okay. And uh, so that means that, um, well, in particular, the intersection of TU and TV is not empty. You know, they're, um, they're infinite trees and all but finitely many of their edges have to be in E gamma because the rest, the, the, the part of the graph that's not in E gamma is just some bounded region. Okay, so this, so this is not empty and more strongly the symmetric difference of these two trees is finite. Okay. Um, so uh, uh, so that proves that um, that the minimum spanning forest in this setting is in fact a tree. And uh, there's a question in the chat: Does this make the minimum spanning forest a one-ended tree? Indeed. So uh, the minimum spanning forest is one-ended, um, right? And so that means that uh, you know, for any uh, uh, two paths. So for any two infinite paths, gamma and gamma prime in the minimum spanning forest, almost surely uh, the symmetric difference of the paths is finite as well. Okay, so um, 
So there's really only one way to go to infinity, uh, if you like. Okay, so uh, are there any questions about that, uh, about that uh, part of the proof or that, that proof? I'd like to talk a little bit more about um, the two-dimensional case still. Um, uh, I'm gonna talk about scaling limit results. So that here I won't be um, telling you proofs, but I'd like to tell you uh, some of what's known and also leave you with some open problems in the planar setting because there is there are definitely interesting things left to do um, before we move to the mean field setting. Okay, um, so uh, so this and we're now going to talk about um, scaling limits in Z two. And this is um, really, uh, I guess I'll call it, whoops. Um, the Garbon uh, Peta Schramm theorem. I mean, that set of authors, in, in fact, had more than one theorem. But um, uh, uh, I see there's a question. So before I go on to that, um, the minimum spanning force uh, is, uh, is one ended. Uh, uh, right. So, um, so if you think about um, uh, uh, if you think about um, what this uh, what this says, it actually says that if you um, well, let, let me try to let me try to explain. Maybe I can try to explain uh, why it's one ended in, in a little more detail on the on the break. I'd like to just um, uh, finish with the um, the planar percolation discussion first. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. I also need a second to think about that. Um, and I think I missed an M. Okay, so uh, so the setting for this discussion is um, is the triangular lattice. Okay, so this is um, this is not a sort of uh, fully uh, universal picture because we know more about um, planar percolation um, for certain special lattices than uh, for other lattices. I'll write T for the bold T for the triangular lattice. Okay, and in fact, it's not just for the triangular lattice; it's for a sort of um, uh, special um, way of constructing the edge weights because it's really um, the the setting, the percolation setting where we know the most is for site percolation on the triangular lattice, and uh, the proof actually exploits that structure. And so, um, in order to um, you know, get the most detailed understanding of scaling limits, you need to tailor your minimum spanning tree setting to, uh, to agree with uh, where the most is known about percolation. So, so these authors look at vertex weighted, uh, they build a vertex weighted MST. So you start with uh, the collection of weights um, on the vertices of the torus, which are, you know, IID uniform say. And then define edge vectors. So for an edge UV, the edge vector is so the maximum of uh, XU and XV, and then the second corner is the minimum of XU and XV. Okay, and then you they use these vectors to build the uh, the minimum spanning tree, or the minute, let me call it a um, minimum spanning forest, even though it is indeed a tree. Um, so the rule is that, um, so if you like, you can think of our, our, our regular idea of increasing, of sort of having a parameterized family and adding an edge when it arrives, um, if it joins distinct uh, connected components. Okay, but now the ordering will take us the lexicographic ordering with respect to these vectors. Okay, so that means that an edge UV is in the minimum spanning forest 
if u and v are in different uh, connective components of, uh, let me call these um, the entries of this vector uh, w1 uv and w2 uv. So different connective components of the the uh, the subgraph of the lattice that you get if you only keep edges that sort of lexicographically precede this one. So that's T uh, W1 UV, W2 UV minus. Okay, so that um, that feels a little bit clunky. I want it's 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 a sort of precise way to to define the um, uh, the minimum spanning for us, but there's a sort of a, a, a maybe a nicer way to think about um, what this process is doing in terms of activation times for the vertices. Okay, so if you think of a, if you think of vertex v activating at time v, then you can rephrase this uh, this discussion as follows. So, or this definition as follows. So when uh, so when a vertex uh, u activates, so that's going to be at time. Uh, X u, then it'll try to add edges to uh, to its neighbors. So it can only add edges to its active neighbors. Okay, so to its active neighbors um, in increasing order of their weights. Um, okay, that's that's an equivalent description, right? Because the first coordinate says that when a vertex, um, you know, uh, when we when we start to try to add edges from a given vertex to, to neighbors, to, to a neighbor, it has to have the bigger weight. So you know, if if u has a smaller weight, then it doesn't get to try to add this edge because uh, v hasn't been activated yet. V has the bigger weight, V will be the one to try to add this edge. And then, so when V activates, it looks at all of its active neighbors and tries to add the edges one at a time. Okay, so an edge is added um, if and only if uh, it doesn't create a cycle. Okay, um, so, uh, is that is the definition clear? So you order the edge weights lexicographically for the purpose of Prim's algorithm. Uh, that was a question in the chat. Um, uh, well, I mean, I don't. It isn't really for Prim's algorithm. What I've described is really closer to um, to Kruskal's algorithm. Um, I think because uh, it's sort of a global definition. Um, it's if you like, it's. It yields a dynamics which is sort of very reasonably natural, fairly equivalent to Kruskal, and is closely enough coupled to site percolation for the tools of site percolation to be um, to be be available. Um, I don't know if I have a, a more detailed uh, justification for it than than that, um, uh, or or it's just a formalization of this of this story using uh, the lexicographic ordering, if you like. Okay, so. Uh, so the theorem that's uh, that's proved by uh, by these three authors is the following. So let we're going to rescale the lattice. So we'll let um, let T n be the triangular lattice, but of mesh size one over n instead of one. Uh, and uh, let um, you know MST n be its minimum spanning forest. Okay, then so informally, uh, this minimum spanning tree converges in distribution. Okay, and to be a little bit more formal. Um, you know, this, it takes, making sense of this requires me to tell you sort of what I mean by convergence and distribution in this context, how do, you know, and that, 
requires a bit of thought because these are these are objects that span you know as as the mesh size gets small they're spanning a dense set of points in the plane um so you know if you just naively zoom out and think about the um you know say the hausdorff um sense of convergence for this subset of the lattice you'd just be converging to the to to the whole plane okay so um, if you do something too naive, you, there's sort of no hope for a non-trivial limit. Um, but, um, you know, what you really want to, well, one natural thing to try to understand is what the curves within this minimum spanning tree look like if you take two, uh, you know, points that are macroscopically separated and ask what the, sh what the shape of the random curve in the minimum spanning tree is that connects them. And their theorem addresses that sort of question. So being a little bit more formal, so in particular, you know, if I fix um, some number k of points in, in R2, and then I fix a sequence of lattice points that converge to those points. So uh, xn1 up to xnk in Tn, such that, um, so xni converges to xi for all i from 1 to k, okay, then the subtree, uh, so let's, let me write MSF n of xn1 up to xnk, right? So this is, so we have some minimum spanning forest on this lattice of mesh size 1 over n. It's almost surely a tree. So I can look at the subtree of that tree spanned by a collection of points. That's just the union of all of the paths in the tree between those points. That gives me some random tree embedded in the lattice. So it's some random closed subset of the lattice. Okay. And that tree converges. So, uh, so that subset of the lattice converges in distribution uh, with respect to the Hausdorff distance. on closed subsets of, the, of R2. Okay, so that's, um, uh, so that says that there's some sort of, um, you know, consistency in these pictures as the mesh size gets small. Um, so let me show you a picture of what the, uh, of what the limit looks like. So we saw part of this picture before we saw, um, we saw this, okay? But what this, um, what this theorem is telling you about is about, you know, if I, if I fix, you know, some collection of points in here and ask about what's the shape of the tree that joins up these points within this minimum spanning tree, um, uh, there's a description of that. So this is the sort of picture that you get. Okay, so you have these, um, some sort of fractal uh, paths connecting connecting points. Okay, and this picture is um, a little bit of a lie um, because um, these, the, the, the end points here are not actually um, uniform points in this picture. This is a bit of a special spanning tree. So the, the edges that I've highlighted in this picture, the edges that are in black, so the whole picture has 100,000 points and the edges that are highlighted in this picture are the edges that have at least 5,000 points on either side. So they're the sort of highway edges of the tree. They're the edges that have at least 5% of the tree on each side of the edge, okay? So if you pick a typical point, um, it's probably gonna be, you know, off in one of the little um, like clusters of points hanging off of the ends or hanging off of the sides of one of these points somewhere. Okay, but this, um, this is sort of giving you a relatively good um, description of the global structure and what you'd expect if you sort of sampled two random points now is that the path between them would look like first some little initial segment to hook you into the highways and then follow the highway, you know, and then leave the highway for take the by roads to the to the point on the other side. Okay, so that's um, uh, I mean, th yeah. So this picture isn't a perfect illustration of their theorem, but it does give you some idea of um, of the sorts of random curves that their theorem is about, and in fact. Their theorem kind of talks, uh, an aspect of what they prove talks about the kind of important parts of the, the, the road network as well, 
I'd like to um, I'd like to state that. So this is one property of um, of the limit that they derive, which uh, you can think of as a statement precisely about the um, the black roads in that picture. So um, so um, in the limiting tree. Uh, so let me call that t infinity. And by the limiting tree, you know, there's something, there's some work that needs to be done to make this uh, formal. It's the same work that's required in understanding what it means by uh, convergence and distribution. But if you like, in this, in these limiting curves, in this collection of limiting curves, you could say, uh, so the dimension uh, of the curve connecting any two points is uh, bounded away from one and away from two. So it's, you know, it's at least one because it's an embed, it's a, the image of a line and it's a most two because it lives in two dimensional space. But in fact, it's strictly bounded away from those. That fact was actually known due to earlier work uh, by um, Eisenman, um, uh, Richard, uh, Newman and Wilson. Okay, and then the thing that I, I sort of said I was about to tell you is about the, the black curves. So um, this says that um, the dimension of the curve connecting uh, any two branch points of, uh, of T infinity uh, is almost surely bounded above by, well, it's strictly less than seven quarters. Okay. So, uh, so this statement, um, uh, what this statement says is precisely that if you uh, if you stay away from the the most insignificant uh, little rural roads uh, of the tree, if you move inwards to after there's been some non-trivial branching, so that there's sort of some macroscopic mass, then the curves then there's an upper this this upper dimension bound on these curves that's seven quarters. Okay, so you might think well if 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 the, if this so this result is saying something like, as soon as you move away from the leaves of this tree, then the, then the dimension of the curves is at most seven quarters. And you might think that that implies that the curves themselves have dimension at most seven quarters. But, um, but of course, you know, I can draw a sort of a curve that's smooth in the middle and then gets wigglier and wigglier as it approaches its endpoints. So that if I sort of move any positive distance away from the endpoints, I have a nice smooth rectifiable curve but if i include the endpoints then uh then i don't anymore okay so it's pl plausible that something like that is happening here as well it's not ruled out by the re result i just told you okay um so uh i'm gonna finish this section on planar probability with some questions that remain um two of them about minimum spanning trees and one a kind of witness of our of, of the difficulty of studying um distances and planar uh, graphs. So, uh, so the first one is about the, um, the d going beyond this two-dimensional lattice setting uh, where you can, I mean, beyond the triangular lattice setting where you can exploit a lot of special information about um, uh, site percolation on that lattice. So let's look at the distance uh, Uh, so the graph distance from zero to the boundary of the box um, in the minimum spanning tree um, of Z2. Okay, so it would be nice to know, you know, this distance This distance is trivially at least n, right? Because already, um, just if you want to, you can follow the shortest lattice path uh, to, uh, I mean, 
any path in the lattice has at least n edges to get you from the origin to the outside of the box. Okay, and it's also trivially at most like n squared because the path can't do more than use like all the edges of the of, of the box. Okay, and so the conjecture is effectively just that neither of those bounds is tight. Okay, so um, prove that there's some positive epsilon such that dn over n to the one plus epsilon tends to infinity in probability and dn over n to the two minus epsilon tends to zero in probability. Okay, so there's, um, uh, I mentioned this result of um, Eisenman, uh, Burchard, Newman, and Wilson uh, before. So this is, this is a result which um, more or less says that in the planar setting, uh, you can use the per percolation theory, in particular Rousseau-Seymour-Welsh theory, to um, kind of uh, get a toolkit for proving dimension upper bounds and lower bounds on the scaling limits of, of curves in random trees. So they, so they managed to prove that for any subsequential limit of, of these curves, the dimension will be strictly between one and two. Um, but their theorem hasn't, I mean, the, the way it's written, it doesn't actually yield concrete information about, uh, about what happens for finite n. So it'd be interesting to know what's going on for finite n there. Um, okay, a second, uh, second question um, is about a setting, a percolation setting which has seen some success recently, uh, but uh, for which much less is known than uh, the planar setting still. So this is, um, uh, I'm going to again look at the, the distance uh, from zero to uh, sort of the boundary of um, some box. But now I, I'm including this cross K here because the lattice um, that we're interested in is a sort of fattened um, Z2. So you look at the lattice Z2 cross the integers one up to K. Okay, so think of this as just taking k copies of z2 and then adding vertical edge edges between, um, you know, um, level one and level two and then level two and level three and so on. Okay, so this is, this graph is called, you know, the slab. So, so in the last sort of five years, six years, um, uh, people have figured out enough of how to extend enough of the percolation theory from the planar setting to this slightly fattened planar setting to do things like prove that there's no percolation at criticality on this lattice. Okay, and actually there's even one paper on the minimum spanning forest for this lattice, which shows that it's uh, almost surely one-ended. Okay, so we know a little bit about the minimum spanning forest, but we don't know um, anything about its diameter. So in this setting, you know, just proving that there's, there's no eisenman Burchard theory either. So um, proving that the distance DNK you know, is super linear would already be um, uh, non-trivial or proving that uh, it's sub-quadratic. Um, neither of those facts are known. So really just the first non-trivial bounds. Okay. And, um, you know, to, to give you a, just a sense of um, the, the, <laughs> the fact that, um, you know, understanding things, as I said, about graph distances in uh, random subsets of the lattice can be hard. Here's a question of Chris Birdsey, which isn't directly about minimum spanning uh, trees at all, um, but it's about random walks. So if you let Rn be the random walk trace, uh, from zero to the boundary of the box. Okay, so what does this mean? You fix a large box, you let simple random walk run until it, uh, you know, reaches the boundary of the box. And this gives you some subgraph of, uh, I mean, it could be a, a more complicated drawing, you know, it could do all sorts of, of things, intersect itself a bunch, right? Then you look at, um, so this, but this, this thing is some subgraph of the lattice. Um, and then let dn here be the distance from the origin to the, this boundary vertex. So in the graph 
Rn. So that's this guy in pink. Okay. So prove or disprove that um, you know there's some ep positive epsilon such that this um, dn is at least n to the one plus epsilon with high probability. Okay, so question is, does, does a random walk build you a quite direct route to the boundary of the box or does it force you to take some circuitous route to reach the, the boundary? Okay, you know, now in this picture, you don't have to follow the tra trajectory that the random walk took. You're allowed to take the most direct path that you want to get to the, uh, to the boundary. Okay, um, so that, that section took me um, a little bit longer than I, uh, I expected, but that's it for, um, for planar uh, uh, minimum spanning trees and Euclidean minimum spanning trees, unless there are further questions. Um, I'm gonna postpone uh, responding to the question about the one-endedness until the end of the lecture, just because I need to, um, I think if I try to, to, to do it online, I'm gonna confuse myself. I'd rather um, sort of take two minutes to think before I answer. Uh, there's another question in the chat. Is this conjecture to be some kind of branching SLE? Uh, no, I don't think it is. Um, uh, I mean, it, in fact, uh, the, the paper by, so these scaling limit, these, these pictures, there's, um, there's a conjecture in the paper by Garvan Petit-Schram about, about this, um, uh, which uh, uh, is that the limit is not in fact a conformally invariant object. So uh, it certainly has some sort of close links to uh, critical percolation, but, uh, but the curves are not exactly percolation curves. I mean, if you, you know, in particular, if you sort of take a given percolation component, <coughs> it'll have lots of, at, at criticality, it'll have lots of small cycles all over the place. Okay, and those, and then the minimum spanning tree operation will break those cycles in some way that relates to the edge weights. And there's a heuristic that they give for why that should not yield uh, a conformally invariant object. Um, uh, right. Um, there's another question in the chat. Can you just talk a little bit more about the algorithm, please? I feel I didn't get the Garbon result very well. So, uh, so I guess the main, you know, the, th this is the most detailed uh, uh, explicit statement I made about what they prove is that if you take a sequence of lattice points, which, which are converging to points in R2 and look at the random curves in the minimum spanning forest between those points, that that gives you some, you know, random closed subset of R2. And if you like, <coughs> you can couple those uh, so the convergence and distribution in the Hausdorff sense is equivalent to saying you can couple those trees as n changes uh, so that those curves converge almost surely to some limiting curves in the in the Hausdorff sense so that the you know if you just take the you take this limit you know if you imagine that this is the limiting picture okay or this is this is sort of a, a guess for the limiting picture if you just fatten these curves by you know giving yourself a little epsilon ball around the curves then the finite trees can be coupled so that almost surely for all n sufficiently large, the finite trees uh, stay within these fattened um, regions around the, around the limiting curves. Okay. Um, and maybe we can uh, discuss a little bit more uh, at the end of the, uh, the lecture, if you like. Okay. Um, so, there's, you know, se there are several beautiful results in the Euclidean setting. There's a lot that's left to prove. Ah, I forgot one more conjecture that I wanted to mention. This is in, uh, in D greater than two. So I mentioned that it's not known whether the minimum spanning uh, forest uh, is a tree in high dimensions. But in fact, there's an even weaker conjecture, which is that, um, so, uh, so for any, uh, for any d uh, greater than one, uh, the probability that the number of connected components uh, 
of the minimum spanning forest in ZD is either uh, one or infinity, that this should be equal to one. So this, so this isn't saying, you know, uh, this isn't saying it's certainly certain to be a forest. Uh, it's just saying it's it's either going to be a forest or it's going to be a tree. It's not going to um, sort of sometimes be one and sometimes be the other. There should be some sort of a, a zero one law or an almost sure result about the number. Uh, and this is saying uh, it should be. Um, sorry, what I just said was a little bit accurate. Was a little bit inaccurate. Um, this is just this is just ask, asking for to rule out the possibility that there's some positive. Um, but finite number of uh, connected components is greater than one. Okay, so that somehow should be um, much easier than uh, than sh determining that that there are indeed infinitely many components. But we also don't know the answer to that. Okay, um, so that that really is the last thing I'll say about Euclidean uh, MSTs. Uh, and now we'll go on to the the mean field. Let me take a, a two minute break and get some water. Okay, so um, continuing on. Um, so the setting here is uh, the complete graph with IID uh, edge weights as before. Okay, and um, I'll, I'll write um, uh, MSTN for the uh, for the minimum spanning tree of KN with these edge weights. Okay, and I'd like to also uh, give myself the general terminology. So diameter, so diam G is the um, the maximum graph distance between any two vertices of graph G. Okay, so the, the goal of this section is to tell you about um, the diameter of this minimum spanning tree. Uh, so, uh, so this is n to the third in probability. Okay, so um, so this is, if you like, um, the this is a natural kind of question to ask in the same flavor of the questions one asks in the Euclidean setting. So in the Euclidean setting, you might want to know um, the dimension of these curves, right? But the dimension of the curves is sort of linked to uh, the distance between points because heuristically, if um, well, you know, heuristically, if in the limit this curve has dimension eight fifths, then that suggests that in the finite dimensional, uh, in the finite lattice, you'd expect the sort of distance between two points to be like 
n to the 8 over 5, roughly. OK? Um, so, uh, uh, you know, and, and similarly, you can sort of invert that and say if the, um, if the curves, if sort of typical distances ha are of order, you know, n to the gamma, then the volume growth around a given point should be uh, like n to the 2 over gamma. Um, in order to sort of fill up the the whole lattice, the n squared points by the time you uh, uh, get out to distance n to the gamma. Okay, so in the um, in in the in the set, in a non-spatial setting like the complete graph, uh, we don't um, we can't necessarily talk about uh, dimensions of curves, but we can still ask about volume growth and diameter, and uh, and that should in turn give us information sort of about how we might rescale the minimum spanning tree if we wanted to get some compact uh, limit object. Okay, so this is this is a sort of natural first step to understanding the global structure of the minimum spanning tree. Okay, in a, I'll also talk about uh, um, uh, the local structure later and, and discuss how, so this minimum spanning tree has uh, locally cubic volume growth. Okay, so this is to say that if you look at, you know, the ball in um, the set of points uh, in, in Kn, such that uh, the distance from say one to V is at most R in the, in the minimum spanning tree, that that grows in some sense like uh, R cubed. So there's sort of cubically many points a distance uh, at a given distance from the um, from a fixed point. Okay. Um, so these two facts are sort of naturally clearly related to one another. Um, so I'll tell you this. Uh, 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 so there's a question in the chat. Uh, do you want diameter minimum spanning tree? Yes, thank you. Um, that should be the diameter of the minimum spanning tree. Um, and the other question was, should this be um, for R fix as n tends to infinity? Yeah, so in fact, we'll, um, we'll sort of talk about this directly on a, on a kind of local limit object, that it is for, for R fix as n tends to infinity, but you can also interpret it directly at n equals infinity if you like. Okay, so, um, so let me start by giving you sort of the, um, the, the approach one can take to understand this diameter. So, um, so remember that in Kriskel's algorithm, uh, we coupled the minimum spanning tree uh, growth with the graph process um, so that at all times the components are the same, right? So if, if I write FNP for the subgraph um, of the MST, uh, of, sorry, of, MS, of MSTN, with only edges of weight at most p, right? Then uh, we we saw um, so the analysis of Kruskal's algorithm showed that um, you know for any uh, p between zero and one. GNP and FNP have the same connected components. Right? So let's think about um, what that means, what we can sort of instantly say about the, uh, the structure of the, um, of the minimum spanning uh, tree, right? The, the minimum spanning tree in this, uh, language is FN1, right? It's what you get once you've added all of the edges, right? So I want to think about um, what our information about the component structure of the of the uh, erdos renyi random graph then tells us about the structure of the minimum spanning forest, right? And I'm going to focus on the regime where we know that uh, the kind of macroscopic structure of the uh, um, the macroscopic components emerge in the Erdős-Renyi process, 
right? So when C is less than one, there are no macroscopic components. We saw that all components are, lin are, are logarithmic in size. Right? Whereas when C is bigger than one, there's a unique component of linear size. And then all other components are logarithmic. Right. And then for C around one, we worked quite a bit to understand the, uh, the typical structure or the sizes of the largest components in the Erdős-Renyi process. But focusing on what it means for the forest now, just already at this level of granularity, we see that, you know, here there's already a unique component of linear size in the tree, or sorry, in the, in the, in the tree process or the graph process. Okay, so that means effectively the large scale structure of the minimum span tree is already formed. Everything that happens after that will be just the attachment of little um, little pieces to to a, to a global skeleton that's already present. <clears throat> okay, so this is really the point when the large scale structure of the of the of the minimum span entry forms. Okay, so um, so we're really gonna understand the diameter by zooming in on what happens around uh, C equals one in the erdős process. Okay, so, um, so to estimate uh, this diameter, we'll zoom in near um, C equals one. So we'll be looking at um, so FNP for P uh, one plus epsilon over N and uh, epsilon sort of little o of one. Okay, so uh, this won't be nearly as uh, technically challenging as when we studied the erdős graph. We'll use some of the results we got from studying erdős the erdős process in this range um, but we won't we won't have to uh, do any sort of detailed analysis like we did there. Um, so let me start by uh, just seeing how this connection can be exploited to get a lower bound. The, lo the lower bound in this uh, in this theorem is quite straightforward. I can basically prove it to you right now. So I'd like to to do that, and it'll give us a sense of how more generally we're going to use the connection. Um, so. Um, uh, uh, thanks. Comment in the chat that that should be one plus one plus epsilon over n on the principle that uh, probabilities should stay uh, uh, less than one. Uh, so I'm going to show the show you that. F so f this is the lower. Let me let me say this is the um, diameter lower bound. So for any positive delta, we can find a k such that uh, the probability that the diameter uh, is a is uh, is less than n to the third over k is less than delta. Okay, so that says that the um, the diameter is at least n to the third of order n to the third in probability. Okay, and let's uh, we'll, we'll get we'll prove this just by looking at um, at what happens for epsilon is zero. Okay, so um, so let's let uh, h be the largest. Well, I'll say c max of g n one over n. Okay, and uh, I'll let t be its minimum spanning tree. So t is the component of Fn one over n uh, with vertex with the same vertex as h. Okay, um, <clears throat> so uh, you know here's the here's the component, right? So this is this is h, and its minimum spanning tree is some 
something that looks like H but doesn't have cycles. So maybe it's maybe it's that, right? So I've sort of broken the broken cycles there and there. Okay. Well, breaking cycles can only increase the diameter, right? So the I mean, when I remove an edge, this this minimum spanning tree has is is, a, is obtained from H by removing some edges. That can only make the diameter increase, right? So uh, the diameter of minimum spanning tree. Well, this this tree T is is contained in the minimum spanning tree, so that so that diameter is at least the diameter of T, which is in turn at least the diameter of H. Okay. But now, um, you know, when we were studying um, the critical random graph, we saw that the size of the largest component in this regime is uh, is order n to the two thirds, right? And its surplus is order one, both in probability. Right, and so that means, I mean, just making these statements quantitative, that says that we can choose some A such that the probability that, you know, H has size at least N to the two thirds over A and the surplus of H is at most A is bigger than say one minus delta over two. Okay, so we, we, we're just saying that the, the probability that H has size at least a small constant n to the two thirds and the surplus is at most a large constant uh, is large. Okay, but now, um, you know, what's the structure of H, right? Conditionally, given the size of H is M and the surplus of H is S, then you know, H looks like uh, a uniformly random element of G, so a uniformly random graph with M vertices and, and surplus S. Okay, this is a this is this is a slight um, lie because the vertex set of H isn't one up to M like like over here. But if we relabel the vertices of H in increasing order so that the labels are just one, two up to M, then this is literally true. Right? And we saw that, you know, what, what, does, what does a graph like this look like? It has uh, sort of path lengths of order m to the half in its kernel, right? And then onto those path lengths, onto that, onto that, uh, that core that's built from the kernel by attaching these random lengths, then you, you, you attach, um, you start, um, this line breaking construction, right? So you have, you have some, this is the sort of schematic uh, of, of a graph H with large size. So this is where M is large and S is bounded. First you picked some random three regular graph, some according to some probability of seeing given kernels, right? So some picture like like this maybe, right? And these edges, these these path lengths were all of order square root m, and then onto that, you started attaching uh, sticks according to a, whose lengths are distributed according to an inhomogeneous Poisson process. Okay, so, um, so this is, um, you know, uh, uh, path lengths in the core are of order m to the half in probability in particular, right? So that says that, um, so here we have a graph which with high probability has size of order n to the two thirds and bounded surplus, okay? So that means that the path lengths in, in the core of that graph will have length of order, well, square root of this with high probability. So, you know, um, that means there's some, uh, well, 
let me say that for any a like we saw above, uh, we can find some other constant b such that if the surplus is at most b, then for a graph which is uniformly drawn from GMS, the probability that the diameter is at least, so square root of size divided by B is bigger than delta over two. Okay, so that means that first with high probability, we have a large graph, this large with surplus at most A. And then if that happens, then with probability, with, with high probability, uh, uh, sorry, the dia that should say the probability of the diameter is less than that is less than delta over two. Okay, then with high probability, the diameter is at least uh, of order square root of the size. Okay, and so that says that, you know, combining those bounds gives that the probability of the diameter is at least, so n to the two thirds over a, that happens with high probability from the first uh, bound, and then we take, that's our m to the half over b. That happens with high probability from the second bound, that's at least one minus delta. Okay, and so that's, um, that's what we were aiming for. The diameter of h should be of order n to the third, right? And here we have a lower bound, which is of order n to the third. Okay, so that's um, so that just says already by by looking at what happens in the random graph at the critical probability one over n, and just focusing on the largest component, we already see a diameter lower bound for the minimum spanning tree of the of the order we claim. Okay, and so that in some sense means that <clears throat> we're very close already at at the critical probability to building the whole structure of the minimum spanning tree, right? The diameter is the global structure. I mean, the diameter is already one of is already into the third, and we're claiming in the theorem that it's going to stay into the one third even if we after we glue all of the rest of the um, the, the bits of the forest onto this one component. Okay, so so the challenge now is to is to understand why the why when you increase this probability from one over n and all the other trees in the forest start to attach themselves to this largest component that it doesn't cause the diameter um, to, uh, to shoot up, okay? And, uh, and well, roughly the reason for that is, this is because this component will quickly sort of become this unique giant component and all of the other components quickly become small. So when they attach, uh, attach on, their contributions become more and more insignificant. Okay, so it's not it's not clear at that level of discussion that that should be um, uh, 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 that, that should yield like a summable bound. There's some work to do to see that it really does. Um, but that's that's the heuristic story that we're going to develop uh, more rigorously in the next lecture. Okay, um, I'm wondering if there's anything I can uh, anything else I can say uh, today. Um, Maybe I'll just leave you with um, with one exercise, which I'll use uh, uh, in in the next lecture. So when we were um, when we were getting when when we used this picture here to get a lower bound, all I did was to say, well, if there's sort of if there's a long path between two vertices in the core, then that um, then that means that the diameter as a whole must be large. Or equivalent, or you could even just say the length of the first stick that attaches to this to this core was was already a, a length sort of order squared m. So that gives us a lower bound on the diameter. Okay, but if I want an upper bound, even at g, even at this you know critical, um, you know just for the just an upper bound on the diameter for this picture, then I should uh, I need to account for how much the diameter increases when I remove edges, right? And you, you, sh you know, you should think if I, if I only have to remove a bounded number of edges, then the diameter shouldn't increase very much. Of course, if I remove, you know, if I remove an edge that splits a, 
splits the graph in two, then I've just increased the diameter to infinity in a sense. So you have to be a bit careful. Um, but the exercise is just asking you to work out what happens when you remove an edge that doesn't disconnect the graph. Okay, so here's, here's an exercise I'll leave you with. So, um, so for any, for any graph G, uh, and any, uh, so, so vertices UV, then the diameter of the graph that I get from, I'm phrasing it in terms of adding the edge. So the diameter of G plus UV is at least the diameter of G minus one over two. Okay, phrasing it in terms of adding an edge uh, means I don't have to worry about um, whether or not the removal disconnects the graph. So this just says adding an edge can't cause the diameter to go down by more than a factor two. Okay, so that's a good spot to, to leave off for today. I think tomorrow we'll, um, we'll prove the upper bound of, uh, of uh, that matches this, this lower bound. And if that doesn't take us to the end of the day, though I think it will, then we'll, I'll, I'll gently start to talk about the, the local structure of the minimum spanning tree. Thanks, everybody.